Anyway, let's talk about the Farm Bill. First of all, this is a work in progress because there are rules still coming out uh, and we're not quite sure exactly how all these things are going to be implemented. Basically, this just says that there might be some errors in here. If you make a decision, it costs you money. You can sue us, but you won't do you any good because we don't have any money anyway. So, you know, it, it, lawyers like that kind of thing. <clears throat> um, there are four major programs and a whole new list. And one of the things that uh, I send over to be copied is frequently asked questions. You probably got a copy of that. There's uh, something for you to take home. There's a, a number of terms that I will run across today, and you may uh, come back to it later. This is the one I'm talking about. <laughs> um, it, um, so a little reference material when you leave to kind of review what we talked about. Uh, first of all is the uh, price loss coverage. This is the simplest of the programs. Uh, it's simply a reference price, and if the marketing year average price drops below the reference price, you're paid the difference. Uh, this is exactly the same design as the counter cyclical program, except it's been renamed, and they have increased the reference prices over what was the target price. Um, the second program is uh, agricultural risk coverage. It's very similar to ARC or ACRE, uh, but it's based on county yields rather than state yields. Um, the other major difference, though, and that's to the good, the other diff difference is it has a 10% stop loss. ACRE had a 25% stop loss. How many of you signed up for ACRE? Anybody sign up for ACRE? A couple of you did, okay. It's a similar kind of thing except rather than using state yield, it'll be at the county yield, and obviously that's closer to the farm. Uh, should be more representative of what's actually going on uh, in your part of the world. The supplemental coverage um, is an insurance contract. Uh, it's similar to area risk, um, or what used to be called GRIP. Uh, the, it's triggered off of the county, but what's different about it from GRIP is that once it triggers, it is tied back to your individual APH rather than just multiples of the county revenue. So it does come back to your APH, but it's triggered strictly from the county. If the county does not trigger, there is no payment. If the county does trigger, there is a payment. It goes back to your APH to determine the size of the payment. And um, even if you don't have a loss on your farm, it doesn't matter, you still get paid. Um, and then STAX is a cotton program. Uh, STAX uh, is also an area of coverage similar to GRIP. Um, with the government paying 80% of the premium. Uh, but it does replace the counter cyclical, excuse me, the uh, PLC program and the ARC program. There is no program for cotton other than stacks. They can still buy insurance, regular crop insurance under stacks, but stacks is their safety net. Okay, these are the um, new um, prices. Um, for reference prices, uh, these serve as the target price or the strike price for the PLC program. Uh, there is also the minimum price that goes into creating the five-year Olympic average for setting the ARC price. Um, so, and they do not change. They're written in the statute, uh, so they're there for five years. Uh, realistically, probably longer than five years because I anticipate down the road not being here at that time so I can say things about the next farm bill, but my guess is it'll be like this one, it'll get stretched out and it'll probably get renewed. So I would think it might end up being a little longer than just the five years, but that's what's on statute right now. Uh, this is the loan rates, as you can see, they didn't really change. Um, these are the national average loan rates. If corn gets down to a buck 95, most corn farmers are in trouble anyway. So if we get that cheap to actually trigger loan payments, probably pretty well done. This is a flow chart of the decisions that will be made. You start up here. First thing you get to do is update your base and your update your pr uh, payment acres. That was supposed to happen this summer. Uh, summer's not over, so it may still happen. Uh, but that um, was announced by the secretary. But you understand the secretary doesn't actually do the work. It's some 
person down at the county FSA office that actually does the work. Uh, what I'm being told back in Kansas and Oklahoma is that they're swamped making out payments for the livestock disaster program. And they're trying to get those out ASAP um, for fear they may end up being subject to uh, sequestration, which being a 7.5% cut in the payment. So once it's been paid, they won't go back after it. Anyway, um, soon, I guess is the answer, you'll be able to update these. You can update one and not the other and vice versa is the way uh, we're interpreting the law. And I think that's correct that everything we've been told that's correct. Um, once you've done that, then you have to choose between ARC and PLC. Um, if you choose ARC, you then have two options. You can choose the individual coverage or you can assume uh, the county coverage. Now, you might think on the surface you'd rather have individual coverage. Uh, in most cases, probably not. Uh, here's why. First of all, uh, it is signed up is by farm serial number. So if you've got two farm serial numbers and you've signed both farm serial numbers up into the individual ARC program, they're going to take crops from both farm serial numbers, all crops, combine that revenue together to count against the guarantee. So uh, if you've got corn and beans, and the corn fails, but the soybeans makes a crop, you may end up with enough revenue when they combine them together uh, to meet the guarantee. Uh, once you do trigger a payment <coughs> under the individual, they pay you on 65% of the base acres, okay? Now, if you have, no ba if you have acres with no base, they get no payment, no payment. Everything's tied back to the base. So if you have acres without base, you get no payment. And you cannot build base. Yes? This ability to change base acres, is that granted to the landowner mm -hmm. or to the farmer? Uh, both are going to have to sign off on that. So land that I rent. Uh, I don't think you can change base on your own. You'd have to have a signature from the landlord. You'd have to have a signature from the landlord. Yeah, because, see, you could change tenants. Could, he could sell it. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, exactly. Um, <clears throat> again, um, and to take that a step further, you don't just willy-nilly change uh, base acres either. You, it depends on did you have... If you want to change the corn base, for example, you would have to actually have those acres planted during the years um, uh, 9 through 12, that history. And if you don't have the history of planting that crop, then you can't just change it. Um, if you could change base, probably what you would move it to would be corn, as opposed to soybeans for sure. Um, and a lot of wheat farmers would like to move base to corn but they're not going to be able to because they weren't planting corn during that period of time, only if they actually have the acres planted. Anyway, um, if you take it at the county level, uh, then it's crop by crop. There's no aggregating across crops. And if the county triggers, um, you get paid the full amount. Now, I realize at the farm level, you know, you could have a yield that the bottom falls out for some reason. Do they get any hail here? Gene? Oh, it does? Really? What's the hail rate in this part of the world? Huh? Yeah, what's the rate? 50 cents? Anybody? Nobody, huh? Well, how cheap is it? Less than, you can't buy it? Is it hail that much? Is it hail that much that you can't even buy it? Really? Okay. Okay, that buck and a half and two bucks, that's what I was looking for. Yeah, I don't consider that to be real hail. A hail rate, to me, starts at about 11 bucks and goes up. You get in the panhandle of Nebraska, you're looking at 30 bucks a hundred. Now, oh, well, really, what's the difference? You get real hail. Yeah, yeah, there are years when they get stones big enough to knock holes in the irrigation pipe. Um, those are softball size hails, and it will completely destroy your irrigation pipe, it'll destroy automobiles and everything else. And as you go west across the plains, you get into those kind of rates. At $30 a hundred, you don't take a zero deductible policy. 
you, you, you assume it's gonna hail every year. The only question is how much or how big are the stones are going to be when it does hail, but you are gonna get hail every year. Um, so you can't afford to not be at zero deductible. Anyway, my point being is that you get, something could drive that yield, say, really low at the farm level and not drive the county low. And you would think, well, I'd be better off with the individual guarantee. No, you wouldn't necessarily. And the reason is, is because ARC has that 10% stop loss. You can't get more than 10% of the expected revenue. So all it takes is a little bit of a yield decline and you maxed out the payment. So even though your farm yield is even lower, your payment is maxed out at 10% and you're only gonna get paid on 65% of the base acres. On the other hand, when you got a mean, you got a standard error around it. Um, Gene knows all about standard errors. Um, but if you, you know, in your stat class up at Penn State, if you um, take a yield like a county and you average more yields together, you get less variation around that yield. The standard error shrinks, right? Less variability. So that's true both to the downside, but it's also true to the upside. In other words, you're more likely to get 120% of your individual yield than you are 120% of the county yield. And when yields go up, that cuts the payment, even with low prices. So again, it could actually work against you because you want, to, if you had zero variation, standard error zero, what would the art evolve into? That is a put option at that point. If there's no yield variability all, at all, it's strictly price at that point. So, but we do know there's some yield variation, uh, even at the county level. Anyway, um, the alternative is to take the price loss coverage um, and if you take PLC and the price drops below the strike price or the reference price for corn, which is um, $3.70, and we're talking about the marketing year average price, we're not talking about the crop insurance price, we're not talking about futures price, we're not talking about your local cash price. It's a national average weighted price for the entire marketing year, and that means that you won't get a payment till roughly a year after harvest. If there's a payment due, you won't see it till a year after harvest because it's the whole marketing year following harvest. For wheat, that's closer to, what, 12? Um, uh, they won't make any payments. They'll make them at the same time, so it's about, um, oh, gee, uh, 14 months, 15 months after harvest before wheat would actually get a payment, or winter wheat, I should say. Anyway, um, but in, you enroll in that. Uh, yield doesn't have any impact just falls below the price that triggers the payment. Now, if you take PLC, then you're eligible to add on the supplemental coverage insurance, and this depends on what level of crop insurance you buy. If you buy 80% coverage, there's not much coverage left from the supplemental coverage. If you buy um, 75% uh, or 70%, there's quite a bit of coverage here. So it just depends on what level of crop insurance you buy under it. The type of crop insurance you buy determines the type of SCO uh, you get. In other words, if you buy revenue protection, then your SCO is going to be a revenue guarantee with the harvest price in place. If you buy yield only coverage, then your SCO will be a yield guarantee only. So it ties it back. Now, if you're not enrolled in the commodity program, why wouldn't you enroll in the commodity program? you might not have any base acres. If you have no base acres, there's no reason to enroll. Um, there are people out there who absolutely hate the government and won't go into any government program. Um, you know, uh, if that's your bias, fine. Uh, you're leaving money on the table and it spends just like all other money does. But nonetheless, uh, people do do strange things sometimes uh, without doing things in their best financial interest. So. There will be cases where that's true, and, and even, all you have to do is not be enrolled in ARC and you're eligible to buy the SCO. Uh, the price loss coverage, again, summary rise, it's a, a, a no yield effect. Uh, the reference prices are set by law. They do not change. Uh, you can update your program yields. It's 90%, I said 09, 90% of the yields from 2008 through 12 is your benchmark yield. Uh, and then the reference price, which is set by law, 
actual price. If it's lower than the reference price, then you pay the difference times your updated program yield or your current program yield if it pays you not to change. Uh, you get paid on 85% of the base acres. It's a one-time selection. So whatever you select, you are in that program for the life of the farm bill. It'll either be ARC or PLC. And I think by that, that means that your landlords will have to sign off, would be my guess. I don't know that for a fact, but that's my expectation, is that your landlords will have to sign off. In fact, if you and your landlord don't agree, then you're not eligible for any payments in 2014. 2014, period. And in 2015, you're automatically dropped into the PLC program. So, big incentive for landlord and tenant to agree. Um, there is a $125,000 payment limit, okay? The ARC program is either county or whole farm, five-year Olympic average price, and what do we know about corn? We're coming off of historical high prices. So it makes this reference price very high relative to history. So, for that reason, a lot of the ARC payment is in the money right now. If you sign up for ARC, basically in, in most cases there's cash there. The only reason there wouldn't be is if that county yield is high enough to take you out of the claim. That's possible. Uh, but uh, my guess is by the time we get to sign up, we're going to have a pretty good idea of what those county yields look like and whether or not there's likely any payment coming your way from the ARC program. That's on the 14 year. The problem with that is we don't know what's going to happen in 15, 16, and 17. Um, and you'll be in ARC for the rest of the program if you select this route. Uh, the benchmark revenue is the reference price times the benchmark yield. It's this value right here that you can't get more than 10% of that value. That's the stop loss. Uh, it has a deductible, 14%. So it's 14% times your uh, benchmark revenue. Uh, and then the actual county yield times the marketing year average price, that's the price for the entire year following harvest, so you, no payments until a year after harvest, um, comes into play, and you take the difference, and you pay it on that basis. You do a similar thing if you take it at the farm level, except at the farm level, uh, you're not, uh, uh, there's uh, no preventive planning if you're at the farm level, uh, and you're only paid on 65% of the base acres rather than 85. And of course, the other thing we talked about is the additional variability might not do you any good. Subject to 125,000 payment limit, 10% benchmark. If you know you're gonna be up against that payment limit, and let's say you've got um, 70 bucks an acre coming under ARC, and you're a really big farm, one of the things you could do is simply enroll enough farm serial numbers because it is farm serial by farm serial. So I can put some of my farm serial numbers in PLC, I can put some of them in ARC, I can put them some of them in county, I can put some of them in, in the individual. So as long as you got, it's everything to sign up is everything by farm serial number. So I could sign up of enough farm serial numbers with a 60 or $70 an acre payment that would max out the payment at 125,000. And if you maxed out the payment, then it really doesn't matter what you do with the rest of it because you're already hit the payment limit, whether the other pays or not won't matter. That way, if for some reason, say out in year 15, the bottom falls out of the market, the other stuff will pay off because it's in PLC and there is no stop in the PLC, okay? Payment just gets bigger under PLC. Uh, only the ARC has that. Where, <clears throat> in the, I keep talking about these marketing year average prices. Uh, these are set. Uh, these are um, the NAS numbers here. Uh, these are the weights right here. Notice in the case of wheat, those first three uh, years, uh, three months of weights, if you uh, look at those numbers, you can see they're very large. And because of that, half the wheat price for the national average price is determined in the first three months of the marketing year. So uh, this price will come out uh, on Thursday. So two days away, We'll have another price. These are all forecast here. We'll have another uh, price. These weights are all forecast, but they don't really change a lot from year to year because farmers don't uh, change their marketing that much. In fact, you can look over here. Here's the final weights from the previous year, and you can see what they, do, what they look like. Actually, I guess it did shift it down about a month from normal. Um, anyway, in, the, in this case, uh, right now, we have uh, the 13 price is now final for wheat. 
So we have that price. We toss this price. Uh, we toss this price. Uh, excuse me. We toss this price. And this price of 550 was actually uh, lower than 550. But as I said, the reference price is the floor, and it goes into that average. Uh, but still, the floor is lower uh, than all the other prices during that five-year period. You would then, once you take out the 777, you average the remaining ones, and you come up with a price of 660. Um, next year, this is going to be the lowest price, uh, probably, uh, based on my forecast anyway, and it will drop out. So if anything, next year's uh, price for the ARC on wheat may actually go up rather than down. And my guess is everything you've read says the price is going to go down next year. In the case of wheat, I don't think it will. I think it's a good chance it's going to go up. Uh, and that will actually increase the ARC guarantee on wheat if what? If, yeah, if the county yield doesn't go down, that five-year average county yield, because it's five-year average price times five-year average yield. So there will be some counties where it might actually go down even if the price number goes up. Make sense? May not make sense, but I mean, do you understand the formula? <laughs> okay. Um, where do you get those prices at? <clears throat> well, I can tell you a really easy place. You can get them from us. Um, and this is one of the few things in life that won't cost you anything. Um, what we do is we update these prices, and I do it for corn and soybeans. I'll show you corn in a minute. We update them on agmanager.info. Um, this is a website. And what I'm going to send around here is a sheet. Um, if you would like to receive an email from us every time we've updated this website, all you have to do is leave us your email address. We won't sell it to anybody. Uh, we won't give it to uh, football recruits, recruits going to Nebraska or anything like that. Uh, you will have it fully protected. So uh, from that standpoint, uh, all you have to do is leave your email address. Now, don't give me your e email address unless you want to hear from us because I guarantee you, you will hear from us. Some of you may already be on our email list. You are. Yeah, we, you get a lot of stuff from us. But what you do is you just delete the stuff that you don't care about and move on. On the other hand, if it's something that really is important and interesting to you, the advantage is you can just click on it. It'll take you right to the site, and you don't have to hunt for it. Um, the truth is you can go to agmanager.info anytime you want to on your own and look it up, but it may not be as easy to find, or you may not know it's even there. Uh, this way, you know when something new has come out, okay? Uh, anyway, with a 14% deductible, that means um, with an average county yield, you need a price below 568 to trigger payments under ARC. Uh, that compares to a 550 strike under PLC. And here's corn. Um, corn, the 13-year, unlike wheat, is not final, but it's really close. Uh, two more months, and it will be final with all the final weights. These weights are still estimates. These numbers here are all actual uh, coming from NAS. Uh, and at this point, uh, I've got the final price in at 446. At 446, that number um, uh, would go in the average. Uh, what we would strike is the 622 price and the 370 price. Again, that price was actually lower than the reference price, so the reference price replaced it. But it's still the low price, so it drops out. You average these three years right here, and we're looking at a 529 price to set the uh, ARC guarantee. Where's corn trading now? What month? December. Uh, 67 as of yesterday. Don't you mean 467? Yes. You're 367. Excuse me, you got me messed. Yeah, yeah, I wish it was 567. Anybody here sell for 567? Yeah, 367. Yeah, we've been used to saying five bucks, but it's three sixty-seven. Yeah. Um, now you do realize that uh, what about uh, three, four months ago, corn, new crop corn was trading at five bucks, and you all sold some. Anybody sell something? You did. Good. You go to the front of the class. Yeah, you did. All right. Yeah. Not everybody here is greedy. Hanging on. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough to pull the trigger at five bucks when you've been selling corn at six. I understand that. Um, 
but this is where we're at now. What that says, though, with that price drop, now remember that's futures, we've got to get that over to cash, and it's for the whole marketing year, but it's probably a pretty good indication what we're looking at for the next marketing year, which means we're looking at prices right now, I'm forecasting at 378. Okay, if I'm right at 378, that means we're well below this 530 number, right? So you got to have a really big yield not to get the maximum payment. You got to have a really big yield not to get the maximum payment. And that's why I say there's probably cash on the table for the first year, 2014, that you can get under the ARC program. Now, if you take the cash, what's the downside? You're not eligible for SCO. You're not eligible for SCO if you take the cash under the ARC program. That's the downside. Okay? Now, is this about risk management? Or is it, how do I get the most cash out of the government? How many want to manage risk? Really? I'm not sure I believe you. How many of you want to manage, want the biggest payment from the government? Yeah, you want both, probably. Because um, <laughs> I saw hands go up twice. That way you're sure you got the right answer in there somewhere. There really is no right or wrong answer here. The government program at least in the first year, likely, uh, at least it, it looked like for a long time that it was going to be the ARC program is going to give you the biggest payment. But on the other hand, if the bottom falls out of the market and you trade $3 corn for the next five years, the PLC is going to pay a lot more money under that scenario. So if you're really risk adverse, you go to PLC. If you're really risk adverse, yes, sir. Once those big numbers come out of the, the ARC program, doesn't the PLC start looking better? Uh, I, I've, got a, I've got a payoff matrix in about three slides, and I think I've got your answer. If you'll, let me hold up. I've got about three slides to go, and I'll show you a trade-off between PLC and ARC. Uh, I want to talk about risk management versus getting the biggest government payment. The problem is most of the farmers I deal with I don't think are really risk-adverse. Uh, and that's definitely not the case in some. You ought to go to Amarillo, Texas and drink beer with a bunch of cattle feeders because they are an interesting group. You know, they'll sit around, oh yeah, that last pen of cattle, we lost 200 bucks a head on every one of those suckers. Uh, but that's no problem. We'll just three, feed three pens this round and we'll probably make it all back and then some. My only problem is I need a banker with some guts that'll hang in there with me. And that's their attitude. You know, if they weren't feeding cattle, they would be shooting craps in Las Vegas. Uh, it's hard to find really risk adverse farmers, extremely risk adverse. Maybe a little risk adverse, maybe not crazy like Amarillo, but not really risk adverse because if you're really risk adverse, it's tough being in production agriculture because, you know, yields go up and down, prices go up and down, revenues vary, all those things happen. Um, and the insurance doesn't make you whole. It's got that big deductible on the front end. Somebody should tell them in that in Washington, Gene, that that is not uh, making them rich. Anybody collecting insurance is probably not coming out on the best end of the deal. Anyway, at this point, uh, because these prices have dropped, all of a sudden it's making the, the PLC look better than anybody thought it was going to look uh, even 60 days ago. Here is the prices for sorghum. You don't care about that. Here is the soybean numbers. Uh, notice on soybeans, you've got to get a price below 840 to trigger the PLC payment. And we're quite a ways from 840. So the program that's most likely to pay on soybeans is the ARC program, um, would be my uh, bottom line analysis. Here's what you're talking about. Uh, what am I showing? Here's corn, OK? Dan, right? Mm -hmm. Dan, here, I think this is the question you were asking me. Um, this is the average yield for this county. So the average yield is right here. And with an average yield, you need a price below 455 to trigger a payment. And futures is about a buck below 455 right now. What, what do you reference the price set that for? Where does that come from? The, okay, the 455 is the marketing year average price. That's USDA average. That's USDA average. For, and it's weighted. Um, and the heaviest weights for corn are October, November, skip December, January. 
So the first five months of the marketing year will put half the price in place. So by January, we will know half of the price for 2014, uh, 15 marketing year that will settle this payment right here. Because what we're looking at is 2014 payment, okay? And this is not futures, it's typically, uh, it's typ uh, in, as a general statement, uh, this national average price is usually a little bit below the futures price. It, it's a national average cash price. Um, but again, I uh, can't guarantee that. So, you know, futures is the best thing we have right now. And this is about, uh, futures are about a buck lower than this. Not quite, 90 cents lower. Uh, and as this price declines, at 378, for example, you've maxed out that payment. So even if yields go lower, it doesn't increase the payment. Now, if yields go higher, it does start to cut into the payment. So if you get a yield that's 20% higher than normal, then it would take the payment out. Uh, as I said, we're going to know more about those uh, county yields before you actually get to sign up. With an average crop, it's going to take a price down to about 317, 320 range before the PLC will pay more than the uh, ARC pays. And that would be on the county yield. That's on the county yield and the national average price. So that has nothing to do with farm serial numbers or any of that? Not really, other than you've signed that farm serial number up in that program. Yeah. Yeah, there's no measurements made at the farm level. Um, you see, you have to have a price below 350 to trigger a payment. Um, or 370. So at 361, I start getting a payment. I got 1206 because it has to be below 370. Uh, 345, the payment gets bigger. It gets bigger, and we're at 7420, which puts us over the ARC payment because it stopped out the 10% stop loss. <laughs> Notice if the price goes on down, that payment just gets bigger. So if you're really risk adverse and you think we're going to have $2 corn. Your answer is PLC. If you're not that bearish and you're looking at cash on the table, you may want to take the cash. Now that's a tough call, and I don't know that there's a correct answer to this, other than if you're really big and you're gonna max out your payment by enrolling a limited number of farms that will max out the payment at the $74 level, then it makes it easy, because I put enough farms in there, farm serial numbers in to collect the maximum payment and then the rest of the acres and do whatever I want to with because it won't make any difference anyway because I've already hit the farm max. For people around here that have two types of soil that are farming, could you, this would seem like this would be around here we call it shale ground. It's not near as good. This would be where possibly this would fit in better than the other program and on your better ground, put, put the other program in? Well, if you, if you, um, if you have, I, actually, I think it would be the opposite. Your better ground probably will fare better under the county program because it's not going to have a crop loss when the county does. The best ground won't have a loss when the county does. Uh, the poor ground is going to have losses that don't trigger the county level. Okay? You have to think about that one a while. Yeah. And the other thing you have to remember uh, when you're dealing with your individual yield, you also have variation of the upside, and higher yields take you out of the payment. And there's less variation at the county level than there is at the farm level. Anyway, um, this is wheat. Um, again, uh, with wheat, uh, there's no payment at this point unless we get prices below 568, and we're well above 568. So at this point, the only way I see a wheat payment is if there is also a county loss. And to trigger a um, PLC payment, we need price below 550, and we're about 60, 70 cents higher than that. Um, we're up around uh, 612 or so. So we gotta have, um, again, we gotta have prices drop from where they're at anyway. And what else do we know? Half that price is already determined. It's going to make it difficult for it to drop low enough to actually trigger the PLC payment because half the price is already set. It's already been determined. Okay, so um, future prices have got to go even lower to pull that average down to get it even below uh, the 550 number. 
But if it did fall, and it might in future years, uh, you'd need prices down around 484 before the PLC payment will pay more than what the ARC payment does. And if it goes on lower, obviously the PLC payment just gets bigger and this one stopped out at 10%. Yeah? Now, your wheat, what you're showing there, wheat, what wheat are you showing? That's just, just all wheat. Winter wheat is just one price for wheat. All right, so in other words, it don't matter if it's you know, hard wheat or soft wheat? No, it's the national average wheat price and the local county yield. Where are they getting their local county yields from? The local county yields come... They haven't come, changed in the years. Pardon me? No. They haven't changed the, the yields in years. So. Oh, no, 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 no. We're talking about the NASH yields that were reported uh, monthly. I, I, ooh, I, I can't remember what I... I plugged some yields in here from Pennsylvania, I think. Um, yeah, I know I did. I plugged in county yields for Pennsylvania. You'll see that they do bounce around. They come from NASH for the most part. Uh, now, because ACRE and SCO are national programs, in some cases when NAS didn't come up with a number, uh, they um, some way looked at the Ouija board and came up with a number. So they filled one in if NAS didn't provide one. The NAS comes from survey data, okay? Now, in the law, they're allowed to use crop insurance reported yields to determine those county yields. Uh, at this point, I don't think they're using it or using it very much. It's mostly just NAS data. That's what I'm told anything. Do you, have you been told something different, Gene? It's mostly NAS data at this point. Um, I personally think the data is more accurate coming as a crop insurance reported yield. This is why. Because when you get that NAS survey, what you do is you drop everything, you run to the house with that survey, you pull out all your records, and you fill that number accurate down to the tenth of a bushel, right? <laughs> At least two-thirds of you throw it in the trash. About 10% of those who do fill it out, they go, well, I'm going to mess with the government. So they write down yield for corn, 500 bushels an acre. Um, they throw those away, by the way. They're considered outliers. Uh, if they don't fall within a certain range, they figure you are messing with them, and you just throw it away. What happens when you misfile your crop insurance yield? Anybody been down this road before? Don't tell me, I don't wanna know if you've done it. Um, there was a, a person in North Carolina. Now I know you guys wouldn't do that, but down there in North Carolina, you gotta watch those guys. Anyway, the long and the short of it was they were raising tomatoes and um, this guy got his um, employee to go down the rows of tomatoes with a broom and beat the tomatoes over and then they threw a bunch of cocktail ice on top of the tomatoes filed a hail claim on their federal crop contract <laughs> now as it turns out when the employee was confronted with this and facing jail time <clears throat> he wasn't all that loyal and so he decided to testify against the producer involved and if I remember right, he got uh, 72 months in the big house, courtesy of the government for that little shenanigans. And because his, spy, his spouse signed that too, she got 48 months in the big house, but not in the same big house. Yeah, <laughs> probably she didn't want to be in the same big house with him now that I think about it. Yeah, the point is you're signing that contract under penalty of going to jail if you misrepresent what your yield is. Uh, I think that's a lot more solid observation than a survey number. And so I have not, I've wondered for quite some time why they don't use those yields to calculate county yields. Um, not only that, but um, I haven't looked here, but in my part of the world, you know, probably 80% of the farmers are insured. Um, the response rate on those surveys, I'll bet's not more than 20%, um, having been involved in surveys before, because most people do what? They throw it away, uh, unless there's some kind of threat of legal action, um, which I have a little experience with that too. Uh, I am, in fact, an S-Corp. It allows me to come and do seminars and work for insurance companies and other things and get paid. Well, 
Turns out, because I'm an escort, I got a survey from the Commerce Department. It wanted to know how many employees I had, how many I was going to hire, how many I was going to lay off. And I thought, well, <laughs> that's just me. I threw it away because I didn't think it mattered. About two months later, I got a second letter from the Commerce Department. They said, you will fill out that survey. Otherwise, our lawyers want to talk to your lawyers. At that point, since I don't have no lawyers for them to talk to, or none I want to pay anyway, I filled out their survey. So I wrote down, and well, I got three employees, me, myself, and I, thinking about laying I off, laying him off. <laughs> me doesn't do a lot of work, so it's just myself that's running things. Uh, yeah, I sent it back to them. And they were happy at that point. They got the box checked, and they got the paperwork that came in, and I made somebody's job because they got the survey back. So in that case, you know, you start threatening lawsuits why people get, uh, they will fill them out. I mean, if, if you got a letter like that on your NAS survey, you'd, more of you'd probably fill them out, probably incorrectly, but you'd fill them out. Uh, nonetheless, uh, that's where those yields come from, okay? Now, in the future, I could see more of the crop insurance yields being put in that mix. I would hope they would at least consider those observations. This is the soybean uh, number, same story here. And we're looking at an average yield for the county. And then at this point, uh, about 1056, based on current prices, we, um, current yields and prices, that's about the point it's going to trigger with an average yield. As the price comes down, um, you um, get to the point, it takes about a price of around $7, close to it, $717, before PLC pays more assuming the county has an average yield. Now, if the county has above average yields, that can cut into the payment. But nonetheless, uh, for planning purposes, I, I think you really are looking at a number approaching $7, $7 on soybeans before the, uh, it will favor uh, PLC over ARC. And that's why I said I think most likely under uh, the soybeans, ARC is the one most likely to pay on soybeans as opposed to PLC. Um, corn could go either way. Corn could get paid under either program. And if the bottom really does fall out of the market, then, um, um, P uh, well, let me ask you this. You're, I got a room full of experts. How many of you think corn's going to drop below three bucks? How long? This year. <laughs> this year. This year. Well, let's just do, the, do a One short run for it. One day or a month average? Okay, I don't know. Let's just do one day. Is it gonna? Is it, we gonna set the low at three bucks? Or is it go? Yeah, you think it'll set? Will it go lower than three? Two eighty. Two eighty. I got one two eighty. You got to be bearish enough to be at two eighty. Two eighty. Okay, two eighty. So you've all shorted the board, right? A little. Okay. Yeah. If you really believe your own story that you're feeding me, if you're really that bearish you'd be short in the board. What I find interesting is when corn's at eight bucks, farmers won't sell because their short's going to go to nine. And when it's at 360, you're absolutely certain it's going to fall out of bed and go to 250. What is the cure for high prices? High prices. What's the cure for low prices? Low prices, eventually your demand's going to pick up and gobble that up. Eventually they'll start feeding chickens and the hogs will get rid of the disease that they've got running through them right now and they'll and then we'll dump it in the gas tank, too. So, anyway, two Iowa corn crops going in your gas tank right now. Anyway, what do we got here? PLC on wheat and soybeans is unlikely to pay in the first year. Uh, the spread on the PLC and the ARC uh, sorghum, uh, uh, forget about sorghum, uh, corn will need a lower M MYA price than current levels to trigger PLC payments, but we're right at the trigger. We're right at the trigger. So. I think there's a good chance that it will pay. The only question is, is it going to fall down to the 330 range, which is kind of where it has to be before uh, it starts to pay. <laughs> Higher program yields increase the PLC. Um, this is because the PLC is tied to your program yield. So if you can prove higher yields, what I showed you was the program yield being equal to county. If the, your program yield yourself is higher than the county, then that makes PLC a little more attractive. So if your, P, uh, if your program yield is above the county, it is in the favor of PLC. A major crop below 250 makes large PLC payments. Large payments will have less value for big farms because you're going to hit the payment limit. 
So the big payment may not do you any good if you're really large. And in fact, you may want to max uh, with uh, Acre at, at the maximum payment, probably right now, uh, simply enroll enough acres to hit the limit, and then what you do with the soybeans won't matter a lot. Um, crop insurance requires all acres to be insured in the county. That was floated, and that turkey got shot down within three minutes after it was floated, I think. So what it amounts to now is you can not buy, well, take this example here. You plant, uh, you have wheat, plant it on wheat base and roll an arc. Uh, under a different farm serial number, you have wheat planted on wheat base and enrolled in PLC. You have wheat planted on acres with no base. You have wheat planted on sorghum base, and the sorghum is enrolled in PLC. All these scenarios, and you can just substitute corn where I have uh, sorghum. All these uh, scenarios, only A would be ineligible for ARC. I wouldn't be able to buy ARC on my wheat here. Uh, under this farm serial number O, I will be able to buy ARC. So now we don't insure all the acres in the county. And what I'm being told in training, um, crop agents are being told they have to track this, which uh, could turn out interesting because it's got possibilities, a lot of errors. Um, and unlike other uh, people who deal with uh, farm programs uh, on the insurance side, um, they are liable for errors and omissions. Uh, they carry insurance for that, but if they have to file on it, it drives up their premium rates. It's like having too many wrecks. Uh, so this is not a free cost item to track these individually, but that's what uh, they're, they're telling them right now. Um, this, uh, ARC versus individual ARC. A farm level yields are more likely, are more variable, but a really low yield at the farm level may not help you because you're stopped out with that 10% stop loss. Uh, county yields are less variable, so it's less likely that a high yield will take you out of the claim. So you have to think in terms of how much variability is there around those yields. All crops planted on farm serial number are combined together as revenue to count against the individual arc. So each serial number, and if you have more than one serial number in, in individual arc, then they combine those two serial numbers together uh, to come up with this number. All revenue combined from all farm serial numbers, and of course the county pays at 85, this pays at 65. Um, crop insurance. First of all, I object to the word uh, subsidy. Uh, that is a number that's tossed around in Washington with great zeal. Um, let me ask you this, and I've looked at the county numbers. I can tell you right now, most of you over the last 10 years, you've been doing what? Writing premium checks, right? You haven't been collecting. Is that fair? When you're writing that premium check, does that feel like a subsidy? <laughs> Looks more like a cost to me. Looks more like a cost. It is a cost. I, I, this, is a, um, this is a cost share program is what it really is. It's mislabeled as a subsidy. And where do you carry this subsidy thing from an academic standpoint? There are lots of stuff out there that academics would consider subsidies. Um, for example, um, you got oil in the Middle East but it's not gasoline in your tank till you what? You get the oil out of the Middle East. How do you get the oil through the Straits of Hormuz? Lots of people like to shut that down. You get it through there because the shipping lanes are kept open, why? It's called the United States Navy keeps the shipping lanes open. I guess the Brits help out a little bit, but that's about it when it comes to the world's navies. I mean, those are the two big navies, ours particular. And we keep the shipping lanes open for everybody. Was well, that a subsidy to the oil industry? They wouldn't have the oil without it. I mean, you, you can drive that thing as far as you want to. I am a subsidy to farmers uh, because we are a publicly funded uh, research and outreach university, just as Penn State is. Now, in the case of most Kansas farmers, they'd like a refund on their tax money, in my case. But nonetheless, taxpayers are paying uh, for our efforts. Um, if you go into a breeding program like winter canola, it's a new crop in the southern part of Kansas, northern Oklahoma that wasn't there before because it, uh, cold weather would kill it off. Anyway, you spend a lot of research money, public research money, developing a hardy resistant to cold weather um, canola and to the point now they're looking at putting a plant in at Enid, Oklahoma to process canola. Um, who benefits? Well, initially farmers do because they got a new crop they didn't have before to rotate with wheat, 
But over the long run, I would argue consumers benefit because now you've got higher yields coming from both crops that are on the market. And you that raise soybeans probably don't really like canola being on the market, but nonetheless, it will be there and compete with other oils. I mean, you can carry that subsidy thing way out there if you want to. But the bottom line is, this thing is essentially a cost share program with you paying a share of the premium and the government paying a share of the premium. And it's like any other insurance program, uh, if it's really insurance, in most years you don't collect. And when you do collect, it's usually an unprofitable year because you have such big deductibles on the insurance contract before you actually get any payments. Uh, I can almost guarantee you in every case you're better off of the crop. Even with low prices, you're better off of the crop. Even with low prices. You, if you don't have any crop, then you got nothing to sell. You don't have to worry about the price. Um, um, and we're going to talk about should you cut your coverage and add SCO. Uh, crop insurance has become the major safety net. Uh, this farm program we're talking about, at the end of the day, is going to represent about 8% of your revenue. 92% of your revenue is being covered by some form of insurance. Uh, but a big issue came up in the farm bill. It increased the plug yield from 65 to se uh, from 60 to 65 percent of the T yield. This is for uh, low disaster yields. That was in the Senate version. The House increased it to 70 percent. Now, I had a congressional aide call me on that point, and he was quite concerned about raising everybody's guarantee with a plug yield at 70 percent. Um, and what he's worried about is that's going to reward the guy who's planting with a seed box empty, putting no inputs out there, trying to collect insurance every year. Uh, and this is just going to raise his guarantee as a direct result of that. And I should not have said anything, but I did. I inadvertently said, well, why don't you put an area trigger on it, which is what he did. And all of a sudden, this has become big controversy uh, because it's not included. Uh, it's in the law, but they are not going to implement it, at least not the first year. And lo and behold, we had a major drought in the chairman of the House Ag Committee's district. And he's not happy that this rule is not being applied because his farmers would directly benefit from this rule, okay? That's where it's at. Um, but um, Kansas is not the only place that has variable yields. This is Illinois. In 2012, there are 40 counties in the state of Illinois that would meet the test. What this test is, if the county has a yield that's 50% below its 10-year moving average, you would be allowed to exclude that year's yield from your APH. Now, your premium rate will be higher. It will be based on your rated APH. In fact, RMA is given the authority to add rate beyond that if they think it's necessary. But nonetheless, um, it's not just wheat country that would benefit, although that's the assumption of where it would be most. Uh, this is Hamilton County, Kansas, and it's going back 77 years. In 77 years, um, you see there have been a number of years here where it would hit uh, the 80% level. But if you look at the, about the last 40 years, uh, the number greatly shrinks. There's uh, the uh, 76 year, 96, 2002, and 13. So one, two, about four years out of the last 40 have, uh, would have triggered that payment. Um, this is Finney County, by the way, uh, Hamilton County is right on the border with Colorado, down in the southwest corner. Riskiest part of the state to grow wheat. I'm not showing you the best parts of the state. This is dry land wheat in Finney County. This is where Garden City is located. Uh, it's a count of counties east of Hamilton. Uh, you see, we had some losses back here in the 30s, of course. Uh, and then in the mid-50s, it got dry. But over the last, um, oh, nearly 50 years anyway, we've had three hits here although we anticipate 2014 will be one of them. We don't know that for a fact. It may or may not be. This is uh, Garfield County, Oklahoma. This is in the chairman's district, chairman of the House Ag Committee. Two hits, 55, and 2007 was a freeze. Uh, so two years out of the last 77, his county would have met the test. He is betting that 2014 will be one of those years. Again, the numbers aren't out yet, so we don't know that for a fact. This is Adams County, Illinois. It's in the west um, western part of that state, about uh, two-thirds of the way up. Uh, and they had three years, 47, 83, and 2012. Actually, more than Garfield, Oklahoma had. 
uh, in terms of meeting that test. So this is not something that would happen very often. This is Lancaster County, Pennsylvania corn yields. Um, for, and, and your data doesn't go back as far. 1970, as far back as it went. And you didn't start keeping track of planted acres until 72. So there's some years up in here that I had to use harvested acres, okay? Uh, but recently, from 72 on, it's based on planted acres. And you see you had two years here where it would have met the test. 99 had a 63% loss below the 10-year moving average in 2002. John, do you remember what the cause was? Was that drought or is it something else? It was drought. Both years? Yep. Yeah. Um, so, and a pretty big hit. Oh, uh, ooh, I missed, no, no. But here we got one that's the opposite direction, 50% above the average. Do yields vary here? Yeah, they do. Well, I mean, I get told this all the time. When I get out of Kansas, they, they say the only place that yields vary, but you gotta remember, it's varied relative to your own base. In other words, you got 200 bushels that they're measuring off of in Illinois. Out in Kansas, we're measuring off of maybe 100 bushels, okay? And in this part of the world, probably, what, 120 or so? Be, be kind of the average, whatever the average is. Well, I've got it right here. Here's the average yield. And then right over here is the 10-year moving average. So in that year, the average yield for the county was 31.2 bushels. Uh, you know, actually, it looks like it's closer to 100 bushels, doesn't it? 90 bushels on average. That's what USDA said, not what Art said. And these are the numbers. Well, that's planted yield. It's not harvested yield, which would be higher. Um, anyway, now take this down to the farm level. Here, and, and I've got actual records for this. That's why I'm using it. But if you look here, um, I've got two years where this farm would have been in a county. The county dropped below 50%. There was a 72% loss in seven and 14. So those two years he could exclude. Those are the only years in here where he would use a T yield. Uh, because they didn't put the rule in place, we revert back to the 60% T yield. So the plug that's gonna be used is 19 bushels for the year 07, and it went up a little bit. In 14, uh, it will be 20 bushels is the plug, okay? And we average those numbers together. It's 36 simple average, and that's off from an approved APH of the prior year of 42 bushels. So do yields decline with big hits? I have been told by some RMA folks, we can't find declining APH yields. I'm showing you one right here. If you get these big losses, you will have a declining APH. Number two, when you get this kind of loss, uh, the other point is how you set the guarantee. It's a 10-year average. When you have a yield that's 70% below normal, is that not an outlier? That is my justification for tossing it out. When you get a yield that low, and you're putting it into a 10 observations. That's 10 observations. And that 10 observations is supposed to equal your average yield. Well, if you put an outlier, you put two outliers in here, something's happened twice in 70 years, uh, then it starts to tell you that those are probably outliers and this is a way to define them. But nonetheless, this is what it will be this year. And this person's rated APH is gonna drop from 42 bushels, I mean his approved APH, will drop from 42 to 38 bushels on this farm, okay? If they put in the 70% plug, that would have helped some. It would have raised it from 38 to 39. If you allowed him to exclude yields where the county had a 50% loss, it would raise his approved APH to 43 bushels versus 38, um, or the alternative, which is 39. So had this rule been not uh, been put in the law, this would have applied because they would have done the 70% rule, okay? That was, that was what was substituted. The reason they substituted it is because the county trigger actually lowered the cost of the program, which I would anticipate that because there weren't a lot of years where it happened. Okay, looking at this farm over here, he was fortunate he didn't have any wheat planted in 07, so he didn't get that big hit in 07, which helped his future APHs. Uh, this year right here, 2011, was a dry year. That 33 bushels was right at the guarantee so no payment, but still had a yield loss, right? 
Fortunately, again, there was no wheat planted that year. And then in 13, there was no wheat planted on either one of these farms. So as a result of all that, uh, the average yield on this farm is 44 bushels. The approved APH is 44 because there are no plugs going in. Uh, the rated APH uh, for 2014 would be 42, uh, and the approved yield would be 42, again, because there's no plugs going into it. Uh, now, if you could exclude the yield, it would raise this yield a little bit from 44 uh, about 42. So the point is, this only has an impact, and these are all yields that are above the county average. So he's got yields above the county average. What if he got below average yields? Well, then he's got a whole lot of plugs. He's got an 05 plug, he's got a plug in seven, uh, three plugs in a row here of 20 bushels, a plug in 2014. Uh, the rated APH, which is a simple average, is 17 bushels. Uh, his approved APH will be 22, that with all the plugs. Um, if they'd done the 70%, it would have raised it to 24 bushels. Had they excluded the yield, though, his yield would actually have been lower. It had been 22 rather than 24, okay? 30% lower, so, or 7% cut from the alternative in the farm bill. My point is that particular law was supposed to uh, simply reward the best producers in the county and penalize those that were trying to milk the program. Um, but it, it, it worked exactly the way it was supposed to. Um, and um, the question I would ask, if you're willing to insure an Illinois corn farmer in 2011, why does RMA need an APH reduction to insure the same farm in 2013? I mean, I, to, when you're looking at a yield, that happens once every 50 years. Uh, anyway, uh, the 50% rule uh, benefits the insured, probably the agent because it provides additional coverage and therefore more premium and therefore commissions. Um, it was assumed that the rates would be based on the APH policy, uh, but rate setting was left to RMA. Uh, after, uh, the problem is uh, the insurance companies at this point are questioning if there's sufficient rate in the entire program, and then you add another benefit like this 50% rule, and if there's not sufficient rate for the existing program, then using the rating a APH for, the, uh, for this new rule you're in the same boat. If you start out low, you're still low. Um, and one of the major drivers is volatility. Volatility, uh, at this point, I am not finding is correlated with price change or the loss ratio. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, these are the loss years in Illinois corn. Notice that in 05, they had an underwriting loss. A big loss in 2012, 614. That means for every dollar in premium, they paid out $6.14. Actually, that's for every dollar that farmers paid, they paid out about 12 bucks. Um, and then they had an underlying loss in 08. Some of these Corn Belt states may be looking at an underwriting loss in 2014 um, due to low price. It depends on how far this price goes down. These folks have to go back to the reinsurers. One of the things that's not clearly understood, a lot of this stuff is reinsured in Europe and in offshore, et cetera. Reinsurers, pretty simple. Did you make me any money? Answer, no, in 2012. Did you make me any money in 2013? Well, no, we didn't make any money. Did you make any money in 2014? Well, if the answer is no again, they're gonna start asking questions. How can you have a record crop and we've got an underwriting loss. Answer, prices dropped that far and the rates may not be sufficient, okay? That's the answer. Not what they're gonna wanna hear. But at some point, money talks. Um, notice that the, over that 20 year period, Illinois corn has an underwriting loss. For every dollar in premium, they paid out a buck 09. Got an underwriting loss. Rates in 09 were 8.7%. That was the average rate across all contracts in Illinois. Uh, by 2013, that dropped to 6%. Why was it 8.7? That's strictly due to volatility numbers, which I will get to. Now, Kansas wheat is extremely risky. You wouldn't want to insure Kansas wheat, would you? Well, this is Kansas wheat numbers. Ooh, lots of claims, right? Lots of claims. So look at the bottom line. They've actually got an underwriting gain over that 20-year period. 
How can you get an underwriting gain? Well, first of all, notice that these losses, with the exception of that, are all under 220. Why is that important? If the loss is under 20, uh, once the loss exceeds 220, $2.20 in payment for every dollar in premium, the government pays 95% of the loss above 220. So they don't have a lot of risk above 220. Now they're still getting dinged, but a lot of it stopped out. If you've got losses under 220, like they do here, and below 150, the insurance company pays a big share of that underwriting gain. They pay a full share, their full share. And it varies be whether you're in, a, in Iowa versus Kansas versus Pennsylvania. But they pay a full share of the claim, not this 95% stuff, okay? So looking at those, you would rather insure Kansas, right? Because it's got an underwriting gain than Illinois corn if you're an insurance company. Yes, sir? Going to the previous slide with your Illinois corn, uh, where you had coverage per acre with 820. Yeah, that was the average purchase. Yeah. I mean, that's going to change dramatically next year, isn't it? Um, it? It'll go down. It'll go down. But what, it, what I'm looking at is the rate per hundred. The rate per hundred is telling you what they're actually charging. Right, but as the, as the price per acre goes down, the same probably no. No, no, no. It's all tied here. The, the loss ratios are reflecting. If the, if the price goes down, then you, you could still have the same level of lo uh, loss structurally, but you're paying less for that loss. Rather than paying, say, five bucks a bushel for the loss, you're only paying three bucks a bushel. But your, your premium your dollar amount of premium goes down as a result of the lower price. But that doesn't mean the rate per hundred goes down. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It's the rate per hundred that matters. That's what I'm looking at. And this is how you end up with this loss ratio. Actually, you would prefer writing Illinois corn. And the reason is, when you look at Illinois corn, they've only got two years here where they're paying a full share of the loss and it's not a real big loss. And then the one year they do have the big loss, anything above 220 basically goes over to the government side. Now that's not an entirely true statement because they actually at, they combine all crops together. Uh, so for Illinois, that's corn and soybeans, quite frankly. Um, so it's not crop by crop. But nonetheless, that is the principle of why you would let it be there. The other thing is that in 2009, the premium rate was 19%. Uh, in 13, it had dropped to 17% on wheat. So in effect, you're paying three times the premium rate for a third of the coverage in Kansas. You're paying three times the premium rate for a third of the coverage. This is Pennsylvania corn. Uh, there have been some loss years. Um, I'm showing an underwriting loss. I thought I had an underwriting gain. Oh, well, you've got some big hits here. 400 here and 400 here back in 2002. Got a small hit here in 2011. Uh, but at this point, uh, in 09, uh, your highest premium rates were actually in 16. I had anticipated it would be in 09, but it wasn't. So there have been some rate changes as a result of more recent experience. But anyway, 17% was the average rate here. Uh, today, it's down to 12%. So. Uh, they have dropped the rates uh, per hundred, okay? Now, what's going on? Well, in 2012, we had a price of 568, okay? But the volatility was 22% and the premium rate was 8.34%. This is national all corn. Loss ratio that year, 269 nationally all corn. Now, look at 2009, $4 price versus 568. This is likely what we're looking at in 2015, some price near four bucks, okay? Now in that year, we had 39% increase in premium for 35% less coverage. 35, even though the dollar amount went down, we got less coverage but paying higher rate, higher premium for it. And the reason is the 37% volatility drove that premium rate to 11.63% versus 8.34. So uh, the point being is that this is probably what we're looking at this year, but I anticipate a much lower volatility number. That means fewer premium dollars relative to the exposure. 
when back in 2009, I was getting calls from farmers, why are my rates so high? There's the reason, volatility was high. What a question, who's calling me now? The insurance companies are calling me. Yeah, I started getting calls. Well, what the hell happened to our rate? And the answer is the volatility just fell out of bed. And in fact, I put on the website, soybeans was a bargain. That 13% volatility number is a record low. And in the Corn Belt, that cut the premiums by approximately 25%. I was telling anybody who would listen to me, buy all the coverage you think you can afford, because it is, in my view, underpriced. And there's a reason, that number right there. Uh, I don't show any particular relationship between it and payouts. These were record highs. Um, right now for 2015, winter wheat is trading a, le a record low on volatility at 17%, at least going back as far back as I've got history. Now, the, the option market only goes back to 1985. Maybe I should have clarified where the volatility comes from. Would that help? Yeah. The volatility number is based on the premiums that are being paid in Chicago. So if the option is bringing 40 cents, then you get one level of volatility. If the option at the money is bringing 80 cents, that's when you get these 37, 38% premium volatility. So it's just whatever that option is selling for in Chicago. Yes? Now, when you do the volatility on the insurance, what particular options, where, where do they pull their strike prices from? Okay, it's at the money, okay. um, and it is the implied volatility in the market mm -hmm. during the last five trading days of February. And after that, it's a formula that sets the actual number. They adjust it for time to expiration. And I've been able to track that number. I get exactly the same number as RMA does. Uh, there was a rumor going around that RMA had changed this methodology. Um, if they did, uh, no, I don't, I don't know how they could have because I'm still getting the exact same number that they get. So I get the exact same volatility number. So there's no argument over the volatility number. I'm, just not, I'm not totally in agreement on how they use it. Um, the big losses are all in the Great Plains, right? Well, these are all the years with loss ratios over 300. That's when the government starts taking over the payments. And you'll notice they're all in the Corn Belt. They're not in the Great Plains. Why is that? Because in the Great Plains, you pay three times the premium rate for a third of the coverage. That's why. Back to rates. Rate is different than premiums. This is a supplemental coverage. Um, and I got to get move along here pretty quick. Uh, but it's an 86% guarantee uh, minus whatever coverage level you purchased at the farm level. Uh, here's the formula uh, to work it through. Um, the, uh, there is a percent county payment factor that is determined. And once that's determined, then it's multiplied times the farmer's liability. So you go through this formula right here to generate that payment factor. Um, this is an example of 750 bucks, 725 at the county level. Uh, this is the expected revenue. Uh, I put it in at 80% coverage. Uh, at 80% coverage, the uh, county yield number is 140. The revenue to count uh, against the final guarantee is $602. Uh, and you calculate the percent loss and the payment factor here is 49%. That's multiplied times your individual coverage that's coming from your APH and the current prices, okay? And these are crop insurance prices. They're mar marketing your average prices. Um, this is all the formula. You can take that home and work through it, to and you should come up with 49.43%. That is then multiplied times the amount of liability in the uh, SCO coverage. So I've got 140 bushel uh, county yield harvest price of 430 bought 80% coverage, $105 is still deductible because uh, it only starts at 86%. With an 80% contract under it, that only leaves $45 of coverage coming from SCO. Uh, now, if your APH is higher, that number will be higher than $45. But the trigger is all at the county level. So at the county level, you take the farmer's individual coverage and you multiply it times the county trigger, in this case, 49.4%, and you come up with a payment of 2223. Again, there's the formula. Okay? Now, what if the you add this to 70% coverage? Well, if the county yield is still the same, 140, then the 
percentage is going to drop at the county level. So it's down to 18.5%, but you've got more dollars of coverage under SCO, 120, so you're gonna get exactly the same payment. When this scenario pays more is when this county yield or price drop more than what I have it here, okay? And that would be the case here where I've got the county not at 140, but at 120 bushels. At 120 bushels, the percent loss now is 92.7%. Uh, in the first example, you'd be multiplying that times $45. In this example, I'm multiplying it times $120, and the payment's 111.24. So it's all triggered off of the county, all triggered off of the county. But then it ties back to your individual coverage, ties back to your individual coverage. Okay, uh, then I said, suppose I did, if I bought um, RP without that harvest price, okay, that's my underlying contract, then my SCO doesn't have harvest price as a direct result of that. And in this example where I've got 120 bushels and the price goes up, I end up with no payment. I end up with no payment. On the other hand, if I bought revenue protection as my underlying contract, then my SCO also has the harvest price and if the price goes to 550 in the same example, my coverage increases to $132. That's the first thing that happens. But it also it is applied to the county trigger, and in this case, it triggered at 20.3% times the 2720, uh, or excuse me, times the $132 gives me 2720, and that is my payment. If I hadn't had the harvest price, uh, then the payment would have been zero, okay? This is Great Plains. I'm gonna skip over this and let's look at, because I've got, I've got Lancaster County here. Um, I also bought this slide along I didn't have in the handout set, I don't believe, um, which shows the uh, statewide numbers on corn. Uh, if you wanna send those around, that's for Pennsylvania. Um, this is uh, 2014, uh, obviously 15 rates aren't out yet. Pri volatility was at 19%, that was not a record low. Um, 140 bushel uh, APH in this example. And looking across here, 80% uh, coverage is 80, uh, 25.53. Um, and that gives you $517 worth of coverage. Uh, the cost of, of the call is 528 an acre, 91 cents for the put, $19.34 for the yield part. So what I'm doing is you're looking at the difference uh, between YP and RP HPE. Both have exactly the same yield guarantee. The only difference here is this contract protects you against downside prices. Uh, and then we go from RP to revenue protection, which also has the harvest price, and this protects you from prices going up. All three contracts have exactly the same yield guarantee. At this point, it cost you an extra 528 an acre. I converted that to a cost per bushel, so it looks like the option market. And as you can see, the cost of that put is less than a penny a bushel. That is the cheapest price insurance you're ever gonna buy, except for what the government gives you free. The PLC is a free put. Everybody agree with that? PLC is a free put. ARC is a free revenue guarantee. The call is about five cents at this location. Uh, as you can see at these lower coverage levels, it's even negative. They're actually paying you to do this. Uh, how can they go negative? There is one difference in the put inside the insurance contract, and that is when prices go up, the put is not capped at zero. It can take on negative values. And the easiest way to get rid of negative values, buy the harvest price. If you buy the harvest price, it eliminates the negative values. Isn't the harvest price the same as a call? I get this all the time from academics. No, it's not. No, it's not. Because a call will not cover the negative values in that put. If you would give me a full day, I could go through and work through the math for you and I would convince you that I'm right on this. The call replaces not only the price increase, but also cuts the put off at zero. Um, and that is the only difference between the put inside the insurance contract and what's going on in Chicago. Plus the fact that it's adjusted for law, uh, yield. Well, what I call effective strike price, this is the price where if you have an average yield, no crop loss, an average yield, price needs to drop below 323 to trigger a payment. 
with a 70%. So I've got a 323 put. If I go to 80% coverage, my put is now at 370. At 85, it's, um, it's 393. These are the prices where you need a yield with an average yield. Price will have to fall below this level. So in effect, you've got to put uh, roughly at 370 with an average yield, okay? So that tells you something about how valuable that put is inside the insurance contract. Now, one of the things I did was when those volatilities got really high and these options inside the insurance contract were high by historical standards, one of the things you could do is go in there and sell the option out of the insurance contract. Now, you were cutting your coverage when you did that, but you were probably, you're selling it far out of the money. You're selling that option a long ways out of the money. And you could actually sell enough puts that you would cover half the premium and probably never collect it. I can tell you from historical standpoint, you never did. But nonetheless, you could actually cover it. You're writing, you're writing covered puts. Um, when you have really low volatility, those out of the money puts are not worth enough money to justify selling them in order to cut down your premium, or at least in my opinion. But when prices get really high, one option is to sell the option. Same thing if, if we get down to where we got prices below, say, 275 on corn, and you're in PLC, and you're questioning, is it really going to stay there through the whole marketing year? One of the things you could do, or you don't think it's going to go any lower, if the market's down at 275 and you don't think it's going to go any lower, you could actually write options against that, um, against that uh, PLC contract. Because if it does go lower, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to get margin calls from the option you sold, but you'll start collecting bigger um, PLC payments too. No matter, these are, these, all these programs are just very uh, um, derivatives of the option markets and the insurance market. And if they give you something free and you don't like what you got because there's an option market out there, you can actually get rid of it. You can sell it off anytime you want to. Now, if you've never lost money trading options, don't run out there and do that tomorrow, okay? <laughs> If you never lost money trading options, I wouldn't do that tomorrow. But if you think about it, these are all just very uh, derivatives of the puts and calls. Once you understand exactly what's in those, then you can actually take the offsetting position on the board if you want to, if you want to sell it out. If the government gives you something free, you don't think it's going to pay, it may still have value. You can just sell it off. Um, anyway, um, where does SEO fit? Well, for one place, uh, there's a lot of counties when you get into the Southern Plains that don't have coverage greater than 75%. So for sure, they would have coverage now up to 86 at the county level. So what's that add? 11 points to their coverage, okay? Um, people that are up against this payment limit. Um, the government program may not be doing you a lot of good. SCO has no payment limit. It is true crop insurance. Um, and counties with really high rates for the 80 and 85% coverage, uh, the SCOs are cheaper uh, and may pay uh, better. So it's another option that you need to look at. Um, the other thing is the government really wants to sell you an enterprise unit. They really discount the premiums if you're willing to go to an enterprise level. That means all the acres you have in corn in that county are insured as a single unit. Um, anyway, how to compare rates. Uh, volatility drives premium costs more than market prices. Enterprise units give you a big discount. 80% uh, coverage gives you a much higher effective put price um, than does, say, 70%. Um, is harvest price worth the extra premium? Since I'm the guy who actually worked on that uh, 1990, that, what is that, 24 years ago. I don't know where the 24 years went. Uh, I'd be hard pressed to tell you that it's not a not the right way to go. On the other hand, I can find I have found a few cases where adding the harvest price didn't make sense. Primarily when you don't have a proven yield and you have to take the T yield and it's so low, you figure you're not going to trigger any yield loss anyway. Maybe the harvest price doesn't make sense at that point. But it's kind of a rare case where it doesn't make sense, or at least to me. Um, and does adding private hail make any sense? Uh, I want to show you this because I find this example really interesting. This is a 70% guarantee 
which is 124 bucks an acre on sorghum, or he can go 75% corn and raise that coverage to 246. The kicker is though, his rate is 5.39% over here with this lower coverage sorghum. He actually gets the corn at 4.17%. That's right. You can buy more than 100, uh, not quite double the coverage, but getting close for a lower premium rate. Now the premium per acre is higher. You were talking about that earlier, Dan. The premium per acre is higher, but see the coverage is double. That's why the premium per acre is higher. The relevant number is this number here. How do you get that on your farm? Just take the dollars of coverage that they're offering you and take the premium cost and divide the two numbers and you'll come up with the rate that's actually being charged. That's how you get to the number, okay? I don't know how many crop agents actually show that to you, but that's how you get it. So, looking at that offer, what are you gonna plant? How many are gonna plant corn with that kind of insurance guarantee? Rather than sorghum. I think you are. So does crop insurance influence the outcome? Yeah, it does. But does the rate make any sense? That's what I'm asking. How did they get there? Well, first of all, I could go to 80% coverage and not pay much more, 6.7% versus 5.39, even more coverage. And remember what it does to the effective strike price. It raises that up too. I always like to look where the revenue part is too, okay? Well, how did we get there? Right there. First of all, didn't have any heat yield history, so had to substitute in the T yield, okay? Farmers tend to plant their best acres to corn. So I have no reason to, do, to doubt the T yield. RMA supposedly calculates those yields from existing yields in the county. That's what it's supposed to represent. Um, and, and Gene, if any point I say something wrong, you can correct me, but that's my understanding, is that they're supposed to be set based on what's actually produced in that county. I have no reason to doubt that number because I do know farmers plant their best acres to corn rather than sorghum. That's pretty common. The kicker is right here. The volatility on sorghum is 19% and corn is 17. How is that possible? They're both measured on the exact same market. There are no options traded on sorghum. Sorghum does not have a futures market. It's strictly based on corn. This is based on, this is because the contract is settled during the month of October for sorghum. For corn, it's settled in the month of September. Because of the shorter time frame, they reduce the volatility number. And when you reduce the volatility number, what do you do? It reduces the premium. And that's how you cut the premium. Now, does it make sense to discount the premiums on dryland corn in the Great Plains? It doesn't to me. But I don't make the rules. If the government gives me a cow, I go milk her. In fact, I feel an obligation to milk the government cow because it helps educate folks in Washington where the holes are in their contracts, right? So yeah, didn't make sense to me. Now, comparing optional units, again, this is a wheat example, but its principle still applies. In this case, I can buy 70% uh, coverage. It'll cost me 11.48 an acre. I can buy 80% coverage if I go to the enterprise unit and my premium actually drops. 1028 an acre. And the rate also drops as a result, as you would have to in that case. So there is the trade off. Am I willing to uh, do that um, trade off? I'm getting a higher coverage level, but it's going to average everything together. Well, if we're talking about uh, freeze and, and drought um, and similar land that's relatively close together then the 80% enterprise unit makes a lot more sense to me than 70 optional units under that condition, okay? And I can buy private hail if I'm worried about the spot loss. Now, if I got half the acres in the floodplain, the other half up on the hillside, that probably doesn't work. Uh, this is, um, I'll pull this from Lancaster County uh, corn, 70%, I couldn't go, um, uh, and I compared that to 80, so you can see the premiums are quite a bit higher. They jump from um, 2425, uh, 2424 to 2553, so they are higher. Uh, but then I said, okay, I'm gonna buy at 70, and then I'm gonna add the SCO coverage. 
Um, and I don't know where we're at on this SEO premium. I came up with this number looking at the rate that they're charging for wheat. Um, and I haven't seen any official numbers on corn for SEO. They haven't been any published. Now the wheat numbers are out there and, and what I did is I looked at the premium cost per 100 for wheat, uh, which was roughly 12% if you were at the 80% level under SEO. And I don't remember the numbers now, but they dropped down when you went down to the lower coverage levels and I applied it to the corn liability to come up with the number. So um, the rate might actually be lower for corn than it is wheat. But my point being is here, uh, now I'm spending 33 bucks an acre for 70 plus SCO versus 25 for 80% enterprise. Under that 70 SCO combination, a chunk of my risk is being covered at the county level. Under this, everything is at the farm level, but it's the whole farm level. So you gotta think about, well, I've got part of that coverage that's field by field, that's the 70% part, and then I got part of the coverage that's triggered at the county level. Whereas this is more intermediate at the farm level. Where I'm coming from is I'm looking at where does it put that effective strike price? Where does it put that effective strike price? Um, you know, if, if I've got uh, a number up there at the 370, 380 level, then um, at that point, I might, will, I might take the ARC payment, uh, thinking that I will be able to buy enough coverage to protect myself against the downside. What's the fallacy of that argument? Future prices might be lower in 16 and 17, which means the insurance guarantee will be lower in 16 and 17, okay? If you can forecast price for me, I can tell you exactly what to do. If you can give me county yield numbers, I can get it right down to the penny for you. And that's the problem. We don't know where that's going. This is a, a comparison you might want to make. And my point being, if you say, well, I think the 80%, because all these are tied to futures prices, they're all the same market. So I know they're going to move together. And you might think, well, I can go 80% enterprise and I don't know that I'm getting that much extra from the um, SEO. Under that condition, uh, then that decision kind of goes off the table and I can look at the direct comparison between ARC versus PLC to try to simplify things down a little bit. If I'm not worried about the insurance side, and remember on these insurance things, that, that decision's year by year. You can change each year. Uh, the other one is a five-year decision. If you decide to drop your coverage and depend on, um, on the ARC program, 92.5% of your revenue is uninsured. You got no coverage at all. You could have made one change to that ARC program, oh, and a lot of people in the Corn Belt would have canceled their insurance, and that is eliminate the stop loss. Had there been no stop loss in that thing, that essentially turns into a grip contract, and I think there would have been a number of people that would have canceled their insurance in the Corn Belt. Now. It would have been expensive. Number two, some relatively small farms, if they had a big crop loss, would discover all of a sudden they're big farms because they would be over the payment limit. The problem with payment limits is it may be a good average over a five-year period, but that's not relevant when we're talking about payments for big losses because that's when you get the $500,000 claims and you don't have to be a huge farm to get a $500,000 claim. In fact, you get audited, what's the number now? Is it 300? It used to be, used to be they, offer, they audited everything over 100. What's the number? Is it, do you know the number? Is it 200? Okay. Um, there's a certain level of payment that you automatically get audited uh, if you get it. It was 100,000. I know they raised the number. It's not 100,000 anymore. Um, but the point being is, uh, that's when you're going to hit the big number, is when you have the big loss. Now, are you better off with that insurance claim? No, you're not. You'd be better off if you had a crop, because you took a 25 to 30 percent right off the top. Right off the top. Okay. Camp Bill Base. If you didn't get anything else out of today's Camp Bill Base, Write that down. Can't build base. Under no conditions can I build base. I answer that question at least 20 times a day, it seems like. 
can't build base. I don't care what you've done in the past. You cannot end up with more base acres than where you started. You can update the base, and that simply means moving one type of base to another base. The one exception is cotton, and, and they got a term for it. It's not unallocated base, it's something else. But see, cotton no longer has a program. What? Generic. generic base, thank you. And the generic base can be moved anywhere. I assume you probably move it to corn, and that's without any planning history. So unless you've got cotton base, you actually add to actually plant. Does cotton always come out on top? Yeah, those guys know how to play the game. Yes, sir. Can you give a clear answer exactly what base is and why the base is so good out west versus here in PA? Because I get that asked from different people. I have it, my own opinion. But, but you don't have base acres? You have you have a lot of acres you have a lot of acres with no base on it? Right. Okay. Well, first of all, they, they really do have a lot of acres out there that don't have base on it too. Uh, it's not that uncommon. Um, basically, those base acres got set up when we were deep into the farm programs during the um, 70s and 80s, and they really haven't changed since then. And so if you were in an area that was planting, say, alfalfa, I ran into that during that period of time, those acres don't have any base on them. And so it was, you got penalized for growing alfalfa rather than a program crop. Now. In the western states, you had a lot of people that did summer fallow at that time. That summer fallow, pretty much gone in Kansas. Um, they may fallow a little bit, but not like they used to. And what they would, so you'd have half the acres planted and half of it fallowed, growing continuous wheat or summer fallow wheat. As a result, you'd only have half the base because half those acres weren't planted. And that's how you end up with a lot of base, a lot of acres that have no base on it. So. I don't know whether it's more or less in different parts of the country, um, but everywhere I run into, I run into people that have acres that have no base on it, and there is no payment under ARC or PLC if it's not a base acre. So isn't, that's not politically correct, then, huh? I, again, I don't make the, I don't make the rules. <laughs> I don't make the rules. Um, the reason that they tied it to base acres. If you, did, if you were tied to the actual crop and you were to be paid on the actual crop, um, what you do in the Great Plains is you'd shift corn acres to sorghum. With a 395 strike on PLC, you would have a lot of new sorghum acres getting planted. That would help us, though. Not really, because sor sorghum's yeah. a direct competition with yeah. corn. Uh, you can get the uh, fact is, sorghum produces the same amount of ethanol as a bushel of corn. Right. Same amount. And in fact, they even get an advantage if it's considered. Um, What's that term? It's um, the um, uh, basically environmental mumbo jumbo Small something. Footprint. It's what? Small no, there's, there, there's some kind of technology, and I'm not coming up with the right term. If you're the right kind of plant, you qualify as a new generation biofuel. That's the word I'm looking for. And therefore, you can bid higher for corn to feed that plant than you can sorghum. Now we're talking about local basis at that point. But that's real cash. Um, yeah, yeah. It, uh, adding adding sorghum acres no doesn't really help corn because it's a direct competitor. Uh, so they didn't want acres shifting around, uh, and that's why it's tied to the base. And you don't have to plant that crop on your base. If you got wheat base, you don't have to plant wheat on it. If you got corn base, you don't have to plant corn on it. You can plant anything on it you want to. I think the only exception is fruits and vegetables. But yeah, you can plant anything you want to. Um, and if I got wheat base and I plant sorghum on it, but I got my wheat in, rolled in ARC, but I plant sorghum on that wheat base, I can buy the SCO on the sorghum. I can't buy it on wheat, but I can buy it on sorghum. And that adds a whole bunch of new flexibility uh, to this program. Okay? Okay. Uh, you and your landlord have to agree. Enrollment is by farm serial number. Uh, ARC is expected to split irrigated and dry land where there's significant amount of both practices. I don't know what significant is. Uh, that's whatever USDA says it is. Uh, so you'll see some counties, probably not in this part of the world, that will have the ARC payment split. Um, be primarily Nebraska and Kansas. Um, and you can put them in different farm programs. So like if I got three farm serial numbers, I can put one in PLC, I can put one in ARC County, I can put one in farm level ARC. And those not enrolled in ARC can also add the SCO coverage. So you can do a lot of different combinations if you want to. Um, 
If you want more uh, education, and probably most of you don't at this point, um, you can always, uh, these are going to be in Kansas, so may or may not apply to you. You can fly there, uh, uh, and we'll be glad to have you. Uh, first one's going to be in Wichita. Well, on most days, you can fly there. Um, yesterday was not a good day to try to fly anywhere. Uh, apparently had weather in Chicago. That was the story of the airline. My theory is they lost the keys to the plane and couldn't get it started. But nonetheless, <laughs> um, that was their story. What we are working on is an OSU, KSU commodity decision aid. This is in XL. Now, it is a budgetary kind of uh, uh, tool. It's just straightforward XL. It'll work on your machine. And yes, the data for Pennsylvania is being built into it, along with all the other 50 states and all the counties, will be built into this database. That's all written in Excel. It'll be on uh, OSU site. Uh, we, I don't know about the logistics. It may actually, if you come to our site, you, you may be just a link to OSU, and that way we only got one copy out there, and everybody's getting the most recent copy. Um, and uh, the good news is it's free to anybody that wants it. Um, and you will simply download it to your own machine. Uh, if you got a real old copy of Excel, John, I won't guarantee it runs. Uh, so you may have to buy, upgrade your Excel uh, to something a little more recent than 1999. Um, but otherwise, um, we've run this on a number of different um, spreadsheets at this point. Uh, we're not quite ready to release it yet. We're still trying to get some numbers um, from USDA to fill out all those county data files. Uh, but, the, but the bottom line, it will have all of them eventually. Um, that makes it a little different than other decision aids that are out there. It is Excel based, so if you're used to using Excel, uh, and I, I was planning to kind of show it to you, but I'm not going to have time to do that. I can see that right now. And I probably wouldn't run it very well. I have a colleague that's been more involved in this. Um, the, um, and, uh, the history on this, OSU received um, a grant from the Southern Risk Management Center to build this uh, decision tool. And we uh, talked to them. Neither, we didn't have the resources to build one ourselves, so we offered to kick in some money uh, to be co-sponsors with them. So that's how K-State's name ended up on it. Uh, I tell our agents they're just going to have to ignore the orange. There's a lot more orange on it than there is purple. Uh, OSU has already told me, oh, if you want to cough up more money, they'll put more purple on the sheet. Um, I don't think we really care that much about purple, so we're going to pass on that. But nonetheless, um, I just want to make you aware that that is out there and available. Um, uh, we plan to use this one. We also plan to use the Texas A&M decision aid. Uh, A&M's decision aid runs online as opposed to this one is offline. Uh, if you kind of slow internet, um, you'll appreciate having it on your own machine. Uh, to uh, run rather than trying to run it online. Uh, the faster your machine, the faster it'll run, obviously, uh, because it's totally on your machine as opposed to being online. Um, what A&M's model does that this not, does not do is it is a full-blown simulator. It'll come back and give you uh, revenues, and then it'll give you a probability distribution. They'll say there's a 50% chance this will happen. There's a 30% chance this will happen. This is strictly a budgeting tool. What you'll end up with is you'll put in your assumptions on yields and prices. It'll come back um, and generate the results, and then simply change the scenario. Assume low prices and rerun it and see how much impact it has and which program works the best. It will go through and calculate uh, the base acres to come back and tell you if you should update your base or not. It'll calculate the program yields, uh, assuming you pull those records directly off of your um, FSA records when you fill in the data, okay? Um, we are thinking that we might also do a webinar, you know, basically explaining how to use the spreadsheet. Um, we, you know, everybody says, well, ours is simple and straightforward. Well, you start running somebody else's spreadsheet, and sometimes it's not as easy as you think. So we are actually thinking of maybe a webinar might be the way to go to allow more training uh, they're planning to write a manual with that, but heck, most of you don't read the stuff that comes from FSA, so why would you read this manual? Uh, nobody ever reads the manual until the machine doesn't work, right? 
Um, and for that reason, I think a lot of people would prefer an online sort of uh, webinar. And so that's on the table. Um, we talked about doing a live workshop, but we're, we passed on that. Uh, as I said, we're going to use the A&M one, too, which gives us a little different information. Uh, but I think a lot of people would be happier with the simpler solution, and the XL approach is definitely the simpler one. Uh, we're also uh, looking to put together a workshop for our agents, but that wouldn't impact you. And we just received notice that we received funding for this. My colleagues, their response was, oh, crap. Um, but they did fund us. I don't know where we got time to get it done but to put together a national policy conference on drought as it relates to wheat. Um, we're working with the Kansas wheat growers on that. Uh, we don't see that, RMA is the funding source on that one. Uh, we don't see us pulling that off until probably March by the time we get to, that together. Um, it's primarily focused on wheat, but a lot of the issues about rates and volatility and all this other stuff that I've touched on briefly, all those policy questions they apply to corn too. Um, we raise a lot of corn in Kansas. Uh, we rank about 10th nationally, so it's not exactly a non-corn state. Uh, it's not something that's not important to us. Uh, and our wheat acres continue to go down because more people are shifting to corn and sorghum. Uh, if you um, want a really deep in the weeds kind of training workshop, consider Mass. It's on our website. It describes what it is. This is designed for uh, people that are in production agriculture, although we've had, we've had crop agents, we've had brokers go through that program, et cetera. It runs for three or four days, then there's a bunch of stuff that comes out on video. Uh, Michael Taylor, um, and, and when I say Michael Taylor, when she answers the phone, it'll probably surprise you because you're probably not expecting Michael Taylor, but nonetheless, she spells it differently, but that is her name, uh, is heading that up. And she'd be glad to talk to you about it if you have questions. and. Uh, about that, and we've had people from all over the country attend that. If you really want to move on, you can also uh, pick up a master's degree in agribusiness, primarily through um, the internet. You have to be admitted to the graduate school in order to get into that program. Uh, it is a graduate program. And of course, if you want to be on Ag Manager, another source of education, that's what the yellow sheet's about. No cost there, and you can always ask us questions, et cetera. And before I close, I probably should give my disclosures. Uh, number one, I was involved in development of crop revenue coverage. Um, I'm still in the business of developing new insurance products with the private insurance industry, so I've been on that side of it, dealing with reinsurers right now, trying to explain to them why we're losing money. Um, I keep telling them, well, you know, you gotta, you gotta do this on the long run. For them, long run is two years, I think. But nonetheless, um, I'm dealing with that. Uh, and these examples I gave you, that corn example, um, and that 80% uh, versus 70% wheat example, th that in fact is my farm. And those losses were, I looked at the impact of that, 20, that rule, uh, the ones with the really good yields, that too is in fact my farm. Um, and I've been on the side where you raise I guarantee you raised just about, I was two bushels under the, over, under the guarantee in, or excuse me, over the guarantee in 2011. I was two bushels over for both farms because it's all aggregated together. It's all an enterprise unit. Uh, this year, the farm to the east, uh, the east end of that was knocking out 60 bushels. That's a big wheat crop, 60 bushel an acre. That's when the fun starts. You're on that big, and my, um, my uh, tenant, leases these combines, which means it's a year old deer. And you know, when you're cutting 60 bushel wheat with a 40 foot platform, oh, 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 you can just feel that baby hum. You watch the smoke roll, you get excited. You don't care whether you're losing money, making money, it doesn't matter when you see that 60 bushels go through, right? That's what you really like doing. Time you got to the west end of that field, which was not more than a quarter of a mile away. Uh, it was down to about, uh, oh, 20 bushels. Uh, idling, and when we got to the West Farm, it was near zero. Uh, in fact, I don't even know why my tenant cut it. I wouldn't have cut it. I would have called the loss adjuster on it. So I've seen about everything there is. Um, I did, in fact, plant corn. They gave me that. That was my insurance offer, corn versus sorghum. My tenant wanted to plant sorghum. When I saw that insurance 
offer. I said, no, no, we're not going to plant sorghum. He said, well, a corn seed costs a lot more, which means, yeah, the landlord have to cough up some cash to get corn in there, but I still coughed up the cash because it still made more sense. Uh, and we planted corn. The corn crop looks really good right now. Um, I, like most of you, looked at $5 and said, I ain't letting those SOBs at Chicago steal my corn for five bucks. So I waited and sold it four and a half. <laughs> I was afraid I'd have to pay income tax at five. 